welcome to our Future in Space. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Greenblatt. I'm the Vice President for Science and Research at Orbital Assembly Corporation. In this podcast, we explore the technical, economic, political, social, and ethical considerations of moving humanity off this planet and into the solar system. Our species is at an inflection point in its evolution. We now have the ability to sustain human life in low Earth orbit and soon throughout cis lunar space and the rest of the solar system. This is happening for several reasons. The precipitous uh, fall in the cost of launch, the exponential growth of computational capacity, uh, the commercialization of low Earth orbit and soon the, the lunar surface, and the growing realization that we are outstripping, outstripping our planet's resources and we need to find new ways to derive uh, the materials and energy that we need to sustain as a species. So are we going to remain ever locked on this little rock third from the sun or will we expand outward into the solar system and thrive? I'm joined today by my co-host, Eric Ward, the Vice President for Engineering Design. Good morning, Eric, how are you? Good morning, I am doing really well. I'm excited about this interview. Today, we're joined by our guest, Dr. Pekka Janhunen. He's the research manager at the Finnish Meteorological Institute and has a background in space plasma physics. More recently, his research is focused on space habitats and he proposed a concept for Ceres mega satellite habitat for expanding into the solar system in a scalable way. Pekka, welcome to our future in space. Uh, thank you, Eric, and good morning, California. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's evening for me, but it's morning for you. Yep, yeah, a bit of a time change, but you know, with the miracles of modern day technology, we could get you on the on the phone here. So uh, that's right. So wonderful. yeah, so, uh, so you've written this extremely interesting paper, which I discovered sometime uh, mm -hmm. last year, and I'm just going to bring up the title here so that our viewers can see it. It's called Terraforming the Dwarf Planet, Interconnected and Growable Series Mega Satellite World. Uh, Dr. Jan Hunen, I would love to hear a little bit of a background on what got you interested in, um, in doing this study and uh, maybe some of the high level uh, results from it. Yes, okay, so it, it may sound surprising, but this was actually a, a result of a systematic search. So I set out to, to I, I asked myself self the question that what are the requirements for humans to, thr to thrive uh, in an artificial habitat? And then I wrote, simply wrote down these requirements for me and then, then basically made a systematic search for possible technical options and this in our solar system and this is what what then ultimately came out this was not the first idea or even the second not the second idea that i explored but this was the best idea that i could find when writing this this paper mm -hmm. and this paper is about building an artificial habitat around Ceres, which is really scalable so it's, it can scale to billions of people and it, it's not an uh, it, it's, it forms an integrated, interconnected world. So, so it's a global, it, it's a world where travel from, from point A to point B is, is possible and, and, and easy. Okay, wow. There's a lot of really new information here. Uh, you have kind of taken out a page from uh, Gerard K. O'Neill's, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, cylinder concept, you know, which was popularized in the 1970s and really taken it to a new level. Maybe you can explain to us sort of how it differs from that vision. Mm -hmm. And I want you to highlight like this interconnected world uh, mm -hmm. idea for our uh, listeners, because I don't think people quite understand what you ha have mm -hmm. in mind until mm -hmm. I'm going to show some visuals in a minute. But why don't you go ahead and explain and we'll bring them up as we need to. Yes. So so the basic idea is very simple. We just take a number of O'Neill cylinders and we suspend them using man magnetic bearings in a rigid structure, rigid frame. And this frame allows people to migrate, people to travel or migrate between these cylinder cylinders. And, and the reason, the motivation for doing this is that is the fact that uh, the size of a single O'Neill cylinder is limited by material considerations. So, so the tensile strength requirement increases linearly with the radius of the cylinder, and that sets a practical upper limit for for the 
radius and size of a single cylinder and so for that reason sooner or later we need more than one cylinder and then uh, simply putting this in a rigid structure seems technically a simple sim more simple solution than than attempting to do some kind of formation flight mm -hmm. so each cylinder is of course not something that's possible today but it the the physics of it i think has been largely worked out and once we have the ability to construct these large structures in space you're saying t going from one cylinder to hundreds or even millions i guess is mm. just a matter of scale yes that is that is correct and and furthermore also also the size of a single cylinder is not fixed so so in the case that i analyzed there was a certain assumption that i used a certain size but but they could be larger or smaller and also different cylinders in this mega satellite could be of different size from i mean or, or, or the cylinders can be of different sizes so i just made this visual in the visualization i just made them the same size to, 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 just because i was too lazy to program other, <laughs> other sizes <laughs> right i understand so you can make a combination of sizes and they would all work together in this uh uh, mega yes, and I, I would I would envision that that you start we, we we start with smaller cylinders and then with a relatively small seed for this mega satellite and then when we learn how to do it then we gradually uh, increase the size of the cylinders that we use but those old cylinders the, mm -hmm. the small ones they still remain there so we don't delete anything we don't dismantle anything that we have built right okay um and then all of the materials for these cylinders are coming from the, the dwarf planet series in this case? Yes, hopefully. Of course, we, we hope that the fraction, of course, we want to maximize the fraction. That is always the goal. Of course, not all materials come from there initially. So we need to, to import at least uh, plant seeds and, and microprocessors and, and, and stuff like that from Earth. But but yes, indeed. So all the structural materials should we should aim for them to come from Ceres. Okay, so that implies that Ceres has all of the elements that you need to construct a, a, these cylinders and the contents within it. So maybe you can just run mm -hmm. through what some of those essential elements or materials are. Yes. So Ceres is. Well, we don't know exactly what Ceres contains because there hasn't been a landing landing mission yet on Ceres. Uh, but we are thinking that Ceres is mostly like a, like a carbonaceous asteroid. So it contains carbon compounds, water, uh, rock, and, and then also metals, metal oxides, iron, a lot of iron also. Uh, but, but then also Ceres contains most prob probably it contains uh, a, a very nice amount of nitrogen and nitrogen is from my point of view nitrogen is, is perhaps the most critical element that we need for settlements for the reason that we need nitrogen to make air make the, to make the atmosphere of the settlement mm. and and we need about one about one percent or, li or a little bit less of the total mass of the settlement must be nitrogen uh and 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 that is roughly the amount that we have on ceres uh, and nitrogen is more rare element on other solar system bodies uh, at least in the inner solar system as far as we know so right, that was gonna... the big reason why why ceres why we uh, why we think that ceres is is a unique mm -hmm. object in the solar system yeah, I would definitely agree. I mean, nitrogen as a gas, you know, it, it boils at a fairly low temperature. And so even though we see a lot of frozen water mm. in the outer asteroid belt and in the outer solar mm. system, uh, we think that there's comparatively little nitrogen there. And in the inner solar system, there's very little other than what we find on the Earth. And mm. uh, there's some nitrogen in the atmosphere of Venus, but that's mm -hmm. mostly CO2. So it's kind of hard to find a large source of nitrogen that we would need to fill, you know, uh, a civilization, uh, a civilization's worth of cylinders. And uh, 
um, and you've recognized that as a limiting factor. Mm. And and we, we 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 I also thought about possibilities to to do without nitrogen, but but I I came to the conclusion, but that it's not feasible. So mm. so humans could breathe a, a purely oxygen atmosphere at reduced pressure, mm -hmm. but then if we if we do that then we have problems with uh, uh, the risk of fire is is increased and then also uh, it's difficult for insects and birds to <laughs> to fly because the atmosphere is so thin so so the lift that they can produce with wings is is, is lower uh, oh interesting <laughs> i don't think that's ever come up in the uh, you know, in the space exploration so far, where we do have humans at reduced uh, atmospheric pressure, breathing essentially pure oxygen, and mm -hmm. of course we don't bring insects and birds along to uh, the moon or you know mm -hmm. to the ISS yet. Um, and, and also, also it might be that that this pure oxygen atmosphere. I mean, it, it is not certain, but but mm -hmm. there is a possibility that it that it might be somewhat damaging to lungs. In, in, in the in, in the in a lifelong exposure, but this is not certain. But but there is such a risk, at least I think. Mm -hmm. Eric, so were how, you going to say something about? Yeah. Oh yeah, I was just wondering. You, you know, you talk about you know essentially turning Ceres into this you know mega constellation of O'Neill cylinders. How how many O'Neill cylinders of what size? Like how many people could you? support how big could that get by using series as a as a resource yes so so the cylinder that i considered in the paper uh, <clears throat> that has a two kilometer diameter and then a 10 kilometer length and and it can inhabit roughly fifty thousand people the cylinder is actually five plus five kilometers in the length in the long axis so so here you see the five kilometer part, but there is a symmetric. Well, in, on the left figure, you see both parts. So, so there is a plane of symmetry, which contains those mirrors. And then both upward and downward of this plane is, is a cylinder. So it's like a, like a northern and, and southern hemisphere, so to say, <laughs> or, or hemi half space, half space in this case. Okay. So about 50,000 part... people per cylinder in this case. Okay, 50,000 people per cylinder, and basically you build as many as you need at, to support a growing human population. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And this is assuming that we we aim for a population density, which is about 500 per square kilometer, which is the same as in the Netherlands, for example. Okay, so a little dense maybe for the globe as a whole, but uh, certainly mm -hmm. comfortable. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, and of course this is a free parameter. So, so if we think that it's too dense, then we can, of course, change it. We can. There is nothing that forces enforces it to be exactly that. So it was just one number that I used as a starting point in this analysis, because it's good, nice to have some number to get some kind of numerical results. Right, and something close to what Earth is uh, like today is uh, mm -hmm. makes it a familiar reference point, I guess. Yes, exactly. So how many of these then could you build? I mean, you're getting that material, the structural material, the soil, the radiation shielding, all from Ceres. Mm -hmm. Yes, there... yes. The idea is that, yes, indeed. So most of the mass is, is radiation shield and soil. And soil actually doubles also as a radiation shield. So yeah. there is a soil layer. And then also out of outward of the soil, there is a an non-rotating uh, radiation shield, but th that is kind of a technical mm -hmm. choice. But, but yes, uh, about 90, I mean, most of 90 percent, most of the mass is, is this uh, radiation shield, which is about three and a half meters thick overall, which corresponds roughly to, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, so in this picture we see, uh, so on the left we see the rotating cylinder uh, and the artificial gravity points to the right in this picture. Mm -hmm. So the brown mm -hmm. part is the soil, and then there is a gap, vacuum gap between the soil and the radiation shield. And the radiation shield is the gray one, which is uh, a little bit thicker in this case. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, and then so the thermal design 
we need heat pipes across the soil layer and, and the radiation shield also. So we need to keep basically the soil and the radiation shield uh, nearly isothermal internally. And mm. if we do that, then <clears throat> the radiation flux across these these vacuum gaps and, and further from that into into deep space is is just sufficient to to, to provide sufficient cooling. I see. So essentially, you have radiation balance where uh, you're losing in this diagram 141 watts per meter squared from the outside of the radiation shield, and that's balanced by what is coming out of the uh, interior of the cylinder is that right yes and that that value is mostly dissipated sunlight energy so we use mm -hmm. optics to to use natural sunlight which illuminates the the biosphere the green layer that we have there plants basically and all that right. sunlight of course turns into heat and that we have to get rid of that heat mm -hmm. at a suitable temperature Right. I mean, this is a common problem of all space structures that we need energy to do whatever it is we're doing on the inside. In this case, it's mostly supporting a biosphere. But of course, there's some industrial activity, too, presumably. But all of that ultimately turns into heat and you have to get rid of it. Otherwise, you heat up. Mm. Yes. And it's interesting that that the Ceres distance from the sun is is roughly just about right from this perspective. So if Ceres would be closer to the sun, then uh, I don't know how to do this. I mean, then we would have to modify a little bit of of this thermal design. So, 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 so you're so saying 100? We have to fight against uh, coldness in, in even in Ceres distance. So, so we have roughly the 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 the, 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 the optimal optimal radiation equilibrium temperature there. So, how far is Ceres from the Sun in astronomical units? It's uh, I think it's two point. 2.8 astronomical units, if I remember right. Uh, the the okay. orbit is not not exactly circular, so it varies, uh, but but it's not too far from being circle. So so the eccentricity is uh, uh, it, it's it's more than for Earth and it's more than for Mars, but it's it's less than for typical asteroids anyway. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so uh, actually that brings up an interesting question about uh, seasons and how do you keep things constant or mm -hmm. do you have seasons? So mm -hmm. if you're moving, if, if you are moving along an eccentric orbit, the amount of sunlight is going to vary over the course of a, a series year, which I'm guessing is like three or four Earth years, maybe a little longer. Um, do, yes. do you plan? Okay, so do you plan to uh, allow that? Um, sunlight to vary um, is there a way to control that and um, what are the uh, for the yeah, yes yes th this is a good question uh, I didn't consider it in detail in this analysis uh, but certainly there are ways to to modify the sunlight so so you can either choose to make it constant so, so that you basically cancel the the variation of sunlight along the orbit or you can also, if you want to, you can also accept it and and then, I mean, let it vary inside also. Right. Uh, this is a but, question of preference. So mm -hmm. I, I don't. So so because the the orbital period is so much longer than Earth year. So then I, I don't know if it's uh, if it's good or, good idea or not to to let the climate or, or the mm -hmm. sun environment where uh, in that in three and a half year time scale or not this is something that we have to think about and, and maybe explore explore a little bit yeah, i don't think we necessarily know what is healthy i mean of course we have on earth this very strong uh annual cycle but then there's interannual differences between that right you have dry years and wet years wet years with more clouds in certain areas um, and so certainly our ecosystem has been adapted to those changing conditions, but to have a regular, say, five-year period, um, yeah, is, is unknown territory. Yes, there is actually one point that I would like to raise in this context, and, and that is related to the, uh, to the mental well-being of, of humans. <laughs> so, uh, of course, only practice will, will, show, will show how it really goes, but uh, I would think that 
that it's it would be good to have an, a light environment which is all all the time bell ringing a little bit so, so that the light conditions the light environment is never exactly the same so mm -hmm. that it, each day is is slightly different each hour is slightly different because that, uh -huh. that I think is what makes kind of landscapes and and what, what makes life interesting on earth that the the light light is never exactly the same and this this must be done somehow artificially and it can be done artificially in this kind of habitat environment and and i think that this is th th there are very, very of course very ma many ways to how to do it and it just should be done so that uh, people don't get bored with the with an environment which is always exactly the same that yeah, makes sense so yeah it's I know, so true yeah along that line you've thought really carefully about that kind of optical engineering of of these cylinders how we collect the sunlight how we get it mm -hmm. into the into the cylinders could you tell us a little bit about um what solution you kind of got to there mm -hmm. to, to keep radiation out but sunlight coming in yeah sure so so this uh, optical arrangement uh, it uses four reflecting surfaces the first reflecting surface so you just saw in the previous figure it's this planar bring that back. Mirror Sorry. With, with, mm -hmm. yeah this planar mirror or, or actually two mirrors on on both side, yeah. half spaces uh, which uh, produces vertical sunlight mm -hmm. and then in the next uh, slide yes thank you this one so so then the light goes vertically down and it's reflected from the main parabolic mirror which is which con which whose purpose is to concentrate sunlight to increase the intensity of light uh, to, to to balance the the large uh, solar distance of Ceres and then mm -hmm. the light goes through a narrow slit which is uh, a ring at mm -hmm. the top of the cylinder uh, it, uh, and then it, it reflects from an auxiliary mirror or secondary mirror which is also a paraboloid and this after this paraboloid we have again vertical light but now it's uh, concentra concentrated vertical light and this light propagates down or along the cylinder axis in what I call the light channel, light channel. And then in this light channel, um, there is the see kind of the, the ceiling of the light channel. So the ceiling here is now vertical in this picture, but it's the ceiling from the point of view of the people who are living on the mm -hmm. habitat, because we have to remember that the local artificial gravity is now pointing uh, radially outward from the cylinder axis so so it's now gravity is now horizontally in this figure uh, and so we have a, a ceiling which can be lowered and inclined uh, mm -hmm. and, and this 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 uh, moving uh, ceiling is what produces the diurnal cycle the artificial diurnal cycle for us the 24 hour uh, simulated ah. Uh, simulated day and night cycle and, and the ceiling okay, is, so that's a part uh, sorry and the ceiling is not a mirror not a reflecting mirror but it's a diffuse reflector so it's a white white painted mm -hmm. surface or something like that i see okay so you get diffuse sunlight that's not coming from one direction and having a harsh uh angle but rather it's it's kind of uniform illumination coming from above yes exactly and, and this is the point where we can introduce some some very vari little variation so we can have something gleaming or something foggy uh, which which produce this interesting day to day or day to today mm -hmm. or, or hour to hour very little variations in the in the light environment so that it's not always exactly this diffuse white but it has some some variations so, and, and this this uh, lowerable ceiling is, is the place where to engineer this kind of stuff. Gotcha. Okay, so essentially you can tune the ceiling to provide whatever kind of light pattern you want, uh, including, yes. I guess, some concentration. And if you show, show me this other figure where we have this, uh, then we, we, I, I can explain it in more detail. Oh, uh, this one? Yeah, this one, exactly this one. So okay. on the Here left, we see the, the ceiling. Uh, so when the ceiling is uh, inclined in a large angle then we have noon in that sector so we have 
we have mm. three segments or se sectors. Well, segments segments is a better better word. So in the one of the segments, in the upper uppermost one, one we have night time, and the and the ceiling is uh, along the sunlight, so it's not illuminated for for that reason. And in the next segment, we have afternoon, and the ceiling is more inclined. And then in the lowermost segment, we have dawn, so so the se ceiling is inclined but in a small angle. Uh, and of, well, in addition to the so, so when we have night time, we can also use simply blinders in this uh, glass roof of the of the mm -hmm. of the greenhouse of the habitat that is that exists between the uh, the light channel and and the habitat itself to to, to eliminate eliminate also these diffuse uh, stray light reflections. And if we use this kind of scheme, then we it, it turns out that we get a situation where we never lose any sunlight so we go, we, we just direct the sunlight in different places but the total mm -hmm. amount of sunlight that we consume that we dissipate to heat is constant in time and the light curve is such that uh, we have like a, in the morning we have a linear increase of sunlight then around noon we have a four hour uh, sta stable sunlight maximum sunlight and then in the afternoon we have again linear decline of the sunlight and it looks like you're because you're using um you said that you can use all the light uh this implies that if it's daytime one place it has to be nighttime or dawn another so you essentially have different time zones within the so yes exactly yes that is exactly so 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 we need three time zones and and uh. then the, the the differences between them are eight uh, plus minus eight hours. So there mm -hmm. is one zone eight hours, and then one sixteen hours, and then one zero hours. I see. And how are they distributed around the perimeter of the time zone? Is it it's sort of as you move around in a circle, you have the three time zones, or is it divided sort of along the length of the cylinder? It's it's divided at least along the length. Uh, as, as so so here the uh, the length is the vertical axis. So mm -hmm. so it is divided at least along the length, but it could also be, and this is a matter of preference, it's a matter of configuration, it could also be uh, somehow variable uh, along the mm -hmm. azimuth angle, so, so we could also have angular sectors in different time zones, so, okay. so that's up to preference how, how we want to do it. And, and and what if um, what if the people in the cylinder all wanted to live in the same time zone? Would that provide? Would that present an engineering challenge, or is that possible? Yeah, it would be. A, well, it, it's it's certainly possible to do, but it's. Uh, uh, but then we basically lose. Mm -hmm. We we have to re somehow reflect off a lot of sunlight because during nighttime we want to block sunlight and it mm -hmm. has to go somewhere. Right. So and and then if it goes to heat, if it dissipates to some black surface and turns to heat, then we have to manage that heat somehow. So it's possible, but but it's kind of more cumbersome and more inefficient to do. And and also I think that uh, it's kind of a good idea to have somebody awake <laughs> at all hours to <laughs> in, in this habitat. So. It, it, uh, right. I feel safer if, if somebody else is awake when I'm sleeping in this kind of system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I wasn't implying that people would be up for 24 hours, uh, just that we, everybody would have nighttime at the same time of day and, mm -hmm. and, and daytime and kind of what happens to the to the energy. But you're absolutely right. Yeah, then you have this uh, energy management problem that becomes uh, more difficult. So. Yeah, it would be um, interesting. It's a five five kilometer section. You know, that's that's what some about an hour walk, right? You could walk from nighttime, mm -hmm. you know, through afternoon into dawn, and about an hour go into the from one end of the tube to another. But uh, yeah. I mean, you know, it, yeah, or actually, it's like a one and a half kilo. It's it's like one mile long uh, long segment. So so because it's five kilometers divided by three, so it's about one mile. One mile each, each for, for each. One mile from, from so, one time yeah, to the next yeah. time. Mm -hmm. So if you know if if it's nighttime where you are, but you can't sleep, you just you know take a take a nice stroll over to uh to daytime mm -hmm. and right. 
and then no no restaurant has to be open 24 hours a day but just eight hours but there's always one that's open so people can find yeah, their yeah. Uh, their midnight haunt wherever they want right yeah that's a good point i actually didn't come to think about it but it's, it's actually a very practical thing yes mm -hmm. and shift work and so on it's less yeah. of a problem because you're always in the sunlight uh, mm -hmm. when you're awake so interesting yeah well I, I, go ahead eric did you have oh I, I was just gonna ask you know about the kind of self-similarity enabling growth. Um, you know, I know that was a, a, a goal of your design here. Yes. Uh, so how, how did you mm -hmm. achieve that? And, and, and kind of how does that work in a, in a kind of mega satellite like this? Yeah, so, so in this picture, it's kind of displayed. So, so basically you have a disc and then you, you can ex expand, extend that disc from the perimeter. So it's like an island which can conquer new living area from the surrounding ocean. But in this case, it's not ocean, but empty space that surrounds it. And and when you do that, then you, ha you have to expand also those uh, those oblique, those inclined mirrors at the same time. But those mirrors are very lightweight because lightweight because they are only their only function is to is to reflect sunlight. So it can be very thin aluminized uh, membrane what this mirror is made of and and because this mirror sits in microgravity all of this is sitting in microgravity then mm -hmm. it can be very very lightweight structure so so nearly all the mass is in the in the habitat disk uh, in the central disk and and also there it's mainly in the in the cylinders themselves and there especially their radiation shields okay Right. So essentially, as as the uh, colony expands in population, you simply build new habitats at that leading edge, uh, sort of the thickest part of that dotted line, I guess, uh, toward the left side of this diagram. And you are constantly building at that frontier. Mm -hmm. um, and so you're essentially building outward to expand the size of the disk, plus the mirrors, as you said. Is that right? Yes, you, you build always outward. So. Mm -hmm. so, so it's not a fixed not, not a limited world but it's an unlimited world so so if new people new mm -hmm. people come in they you, you just expand the habitat and and keep keep doing keep on doing that so wow that's really fantastic i mean uh, uh the way o'neill had first imagined this you would have a colony at like the earth moon l5 uh, mm -hmm. point right which is a stable point in earth's or or earth moon mm -hmm. orbit but that material would um well the material would probably be derived from the moon or uh near earth asteroids mm -hmm. uh, but he never really talked about how the colony would expand and i don't think he had this scale in mind at all it would sort of be maybe a, a few cylinders clustered together but then you'd have a completely separate system uh orbiting you know uh nearby mm -hmm. um so but this the difference here uh is that everything is connected right so you can actually move from one cylinder to another without having to get in a spaceship is that right i want to bring up that image again of the uh connections yeah t tell us how how you would move from one cylinder to another if you wanted to visit uh, a friend or family member who lived in another <laughs> a city i guess right mm -hmm. so we may have lost pekka temporarily yeah, he's dropped off here. So let's wait for him to rejoin. Yeah, I'm I'm such, such as <laughs> yeah, such the as internet. A, yeah. <laughs> I think it's a, a, a really interesting question to to look at. I know it was important for Pekka to uh to I guess have sustainability essentially, right? And be able to mm -hmm. to conserve your atoms really. So I'd right. be, you know, I'd be interested, in, you know, to kind of see how we approach approach that problem. And yeah, because certainly space travel is an expensive, you know, and and in terms of cost uh, as well as energy consumption. And we're not talking about a rocket like leaving Earth because you don't have the escape velocity problem, but you still have all these resources to to create a you know a uh, pressurized vessel and life support and all of that um to go to another uh, cylinder here 
I think the way he described it is it's basically a, just a big subway. Well, he's coming back here, so I'll bring him. Bring okay. him in. Oh, I, I hi. Think so hi, hi again. So I lost my internet connection for a moment. So so sorry for that. So it was the problem was on my end. Yes, no problem. Let me well, just ask the question again, and that maybe we'll just uh, start. You know, edit this part out. Um, so I was asking about uh, transport between different cylinders and how you had envisioned this. This is quite different from O'Neill's view where uh, you know you would essentially have to get in a spaceship to move from one cylinder to another. And you envisioned something which was quite a bit simpler than that. And I'm gonna bring up the image that we had earlier mm -hmm. showing the close up three dimensional uh, structure of all of these interconnected cylinders. Can you tell us how people would travel from one cylinder to another in your system? Yes, uh, I, I haven't thought about it in, in very great detail, but it would be some kind of um, a vehicle which re which resembles maybe a car or a train so so anyway but so, something some vehicle which moves in a tunnel uh, which is in zero gravity which is in microgravity and which connects those those cylinders okay actually this brings up another question these these are all floating quite close to one another with those mirrors nearly touching are these in free uh, uh, how would I call this? in formation flying or are there physical um, links between them to keep their distances fixed? Uh, physical links, yeah. yeah. So, so the okay. mega satellite frame is, is mm -hmm. what, what, what keeps everything fixed. Okay. And, and so, so then what are the, the advantages of, of mm -hmm. that? It's just technically simpler to, to implement. So because formation fl and it, it, another benefit is that we don't consume propellant mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. ro rocket propulsion is, is something that we, we want to avoid uh, because uh, that, that's a non-renewable resource in the solar system. So all propellant that you use is lost right. forever from the solar system. So it never comes back. So so th there's a lot of water on Ceres and volatiles on Ceres, but it's still a finite amount and we want to avoid consuming rocket propellant in a day by in a daily basis so so we, of course we use it when people migrate from earth to ceres or 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 in the other direction but we don't want to use it in the daily commuting mm -hmm. absolutely that's right so you've basically envisioned that this entire world which you said could could house billions of people a, a planet's yes. worth similar to earth yes all... i mean grow even bigger than earth eventually so mm -hmm. there is in principle <laughs> Even, even that would be possible in principle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Actually, uh, tell us there about is, that. So... Some limit. There is some limit to it, but, but that limit right. is very far away. Well, I'm going to ask know so... what it is. Okay. Can you, can you, um, yeah, is there a limit to how much of series mass you can consume to make these satellites before the system becomes unstable? I guess you still have to have enough mass in series itself so that you're orbiting around a heavy uh, object, right? I mean, there's a... Yeah, sure, that, that is one consideration. Uh, but of course, uh, you could also then, if that hap if you hit, if, if you hit that limit, if, if we hit if we hit that limit, then we could choose to to exit from Ceres orbit and instead orbit the Sun in an orbit oh. which is more or less the same as Ceres orbit. Mm -hmm. uh, the drawback is then that we the, the trip time from, from Ceres to this habitat would, is much longer. So we need more spacecraft. I mean, the the travel time becomes much longer than, and, and that means that we need more capital investment in, in maintaining that fleet of spacecraft, which carries new raw materials from, from Ceres, but, but it's not a fundamental uh, limitation. Uh, but th there is also another well, there, there are some issues regarding re, related to Ceres angular momentum also, which I, I discussed a little bit in this paper. Uh, so okay. when we remove material, if we use the space elevator, I mean, if we use the space elevator, then we are reducing Ceres angular momentum. We are kind of robbing Ceres of, of its angular momentum a little oh, bit. Oh, I see. And, right. and that slows down Ceres rotation. And there is also a risk that, which I discussed a little bit in, which I briefly mentioned in the paper, that 
if if Ceres internal structure is su such that it's fluid inside and it has a solid crust, mm -hmm. uh, then we might cause differential rotation of Ceres <laughs> by this process, and that might create new cryovolcanism <laughs> in the worst case. And, and this is something that, <laughs> something that we would like to avoid. And, and this must be monitored if if we use the space elevator concept that we mm -hmm. don't makes it that we don't create un unwanted cryovolcanism on Ceres. Uh, I'm so glad you thought about that, <laughs> as well as many other things that are probably not quite uh, apparent yet. But uh, yes, we're talking about a planetary transformation on unprecedented scale. Mm -hmm. So we better have thought through carefully what's going to happen to the to the planet as a result. Yeah, I mean, it may sound a little bit funny, but but because I'm a scientist, so my my job is kind of kind of to <laughs> to look into possible future <laughs> future problems. So even yeah. if it's far fetched problem, it's it's good to be at least a little bit aware of it before it before we run actually run into that problem. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's what this program is about: is explain exploring possible futures and their mm -hmm. implications. So I think if we're planning to put billions of people out in the solar system we want to know what the impacts are going to be on the the natural environment um, but i mean there is a simple way to avoid all these issues and that is not to, to not use the space elevator but but instead just use ordinary rocket propulsion i see so so, so in in that case we don't don't modify the angular momentum of of ceres mm -hmm. Okay, but if you do that though, then you are consuming propellant as you're moving from the surface of Ceres to the colony, right? Yes, but but we do it only once for each material packet that we lift up. So so we which just means that we consume a certain fraction of that of that material as propellant. But once we I have see. done that, then it's done, and, and then we don't consume it any further. So it actually depends. The feasibility of that depends on how much exactly how exactly how much volatiles, especially water, there actually is on Ceres. And we don't know it exactly yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're also talking about a pretty light planet in terms of gravity. So the amount of uh, propellant needed to get from the surface to this uh, orbital location is very modest compared even to our moon i believe yes it's very modest it, it's about 500 about half a kilometer per second of of delta v that we require mm -hmm. yeah compared to about 2.4 i think for the moon so mm -hmm. I, and um yeah, okay so um, tw 12 to 13 from Earth and Delta V, depending on your rocket design and staging and gravitational mm -hmm. losses and that sort right. of thing. So a lot, a lot less, right? You're looking at, you know, when an order of magnitude or more che cheaper, I guess, in terms of propellant to get from this, the surface of Ceres is a much smaller body, so. Yeah. It's, yes, it's and even more, even more because it's an exponential rocket equation, so. Yeah. So we okay. really need a, a very modest amount of of propellant to lift something from Ceres. But even that can, can be eliminated if we use the space elevator. But but yeah. then this space elevator has these other mm -hmm. other considerations, but which I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, but by the time we're worried about these instabilities, we're talking about a a, a civilization that now has quite a, a large population. I mean, I Ceres contains about 40% of the mass of the asteroid belt, if I remember correctly. And I it, it's a large fraction. Yeah, go it's ahead. a large fraction anyway. I don't remember exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. But I know that if you converted all the mass of the asteroid belt into O'Neill cylinders, you would have room for uh, trillions of people. So you would have to mm -hmm. make a very large uh, settlement before you start to consume enough of the planet to, to start worrying about these things like the angular mm -hmm. momentum transfer, it sounds like. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yes, so, so the the mass efficiency, I mean, if we when we produce living, living area for, for people, so the mass efficiency in O'Neill cylinder is about one million times more than for, for a planet like Earth, for a terrestrial planet. So because right. there is about... Uh, well, 6,000 kilometers of molten rock below our feet. Mm -hmm. And right. the only purpose for this rock is to create the gravity field, which yeah. keeps yeah. us alive and, and, and keeps the atmosphere there. 
uh, while in the habitat we only need radiation shielding walls, which are correspond to about 10 meter layer mm -hmm. of water or, or similar substance. So, so there right. comes the factor of roughly one million. Yeah. It's a so really and, interesting and metric. Yeah, we're even looking at what one one g right the rotation rate of these is is going to give you the gravity you know equivalent to earth here but without using all that mass to produce it you produce it by the rotation right y yes exactly so we use the centrifugal force yeah. force exactly as in o'neill cylinder yeah so I right just, i mean that's uh, uh, sorry to interject but i just saw a really interesting question from from the chat from the people who are, are watching live um uh, someone asked, uh, what did we learn from the Dawn mission about Ceres? Did, did Dawn reveal any insights that, that might uh, have an impact on a plan like this? Mm, well, I would say that at least we learned the, the existence of nitrogen containing salts, so, so mm -hmm. ammonia salts on Ceres. So we, we basically know positively that there, is, there are a, a, at least some ammonia salts on Ceres, and therefore there is nitrogen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. And that's, okay. that's like you mentioned earlier, that's one of the enabling factors of creating a, a civilization like this, right, is, is being able to have that inert gas to, to backfill the, the atmosphere. Yes, you, yeah. you could replace ammonia by, I mean, you could replace nitrogen by some other inert, inert gas such as argon, but, but argon is even more difficult to find in the solar system than, than nitrogen. Right. Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Any while you're looking at questions, anything else that that pops up right now, Eric? Or oh yeah, there's actually some really interesting ones. Um, uh, let's see here near the beginning. Um, yeah, there was this great question. Uh, you know, uh, Aiden was interested in in the study. You know, kind of how you got from from the very beginning to the end. And we talked a little bit about that. You know, you started from the principles of you know what. Do we need to, you know, support life in space, and mm -hmm. then looked at, okay, how can we make that happen? Um, Aiden was wondering, you know, through that whole process, uh, what was one of your biggest challenges or roadblocks in in going from that initial question to this to this study, and and how did you overcome that? Well, I would say that the <laughs> the biggest roadblock block was just to be brave enough to, to write down the right questions, the, the, the right requirements. I mean, to write the right requirement that we need really 1G gravity and, and a large enough habitat and, and an interconnected world, not, not just an archipelago of isolated mm -hmm. islands. So, I mean, once, once we kind of believe that such solution could exist, then find, actually finding the solution was not not too difficult. I mean, I mm -hmm. just made systematic search of, of all possibilities that, that yeah. we have in the solar system. I mean, I mean there are not so, not so many. There is a finite right. number of bodies in the solar system. And, and then the O'Neill concept is, is the only one that I know that which kind of uh, mm -hmm. enables this 1G gravity. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I thought about various kinds of formation flight uh, scenarios with only with a cluster of O'Neill cylinders, but but then they always consumed propellant, and there was also the risk of collisions between these cylinders. So, for example, right. if we put a large number of these cylinders orbiting Ceres, then there is a risk of collisions. Or if mm -hmm. we put a large number of cylinders orbiting the Sun in the same orbit, then there is an issue that this uh, group of cylinders will drift apart slowly by by these orbital forces, and that could be counteracted by propulsion, but then we are, again have the thing that we need propulsion. And there is also mm -hmm. the issue that if we uh, put a large, class, large, large number of cylinders in Ceres orbit, for example, then they start to shadow each other, these cylinders. So yeah. and it starts to become an issue. Yes, yeah, so you kind yeah, of- Yeah, so you really came up with a, a solution, mm -hmm. a very elegant solution that avoids all of these problems and you found the one place in the solar system well i guess you could orbit another planet like venus or you know or mars or something um uh, yes but... so, so yes you could orbit mars so that's one one option so and and in that case we could use deimos 
as the material source. But Deimos is such a small moon that then we have material only, only up to 100 million <laughs> inhabitants. <laughs> so it's a large, a large number, but it means that it's not the final place. Mm -hmm. So right. it's not, it doesn't scale to the population of Earth. That is for sure. Right. Yeah, that was actually my my next question was if Ceres didn't exist because you know mm -hmm. Ceres is a unique object in the solar system. There's really nothing else yeah. like it, at least not in the inner solar system. Yeah. Maybe there's some mm -hmm. out, you know, in the in the Oort cloud or or the Kuiper yeah. belt. I mean, well, yeah, yeah. So, but, so uh, if Ceres if Ceres is not usable for any reason, then then we would use some other some some asteroid, some carbon mm -hmm. type carbonaceous asteroids, which is more or less in serious type orbit. There are several of okay. such asteroids, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, they are they are smaller than Ceres, maybe about 100 kilometer diameter or 200 kilometer diameter. And then the, but the orbital eccentricities tend to be larger than Ceres. Uh, so that is a drawback, but it's, it's not a showstopper. So if Ceres is not available, then we would use some one of these other these asteroids, I, I suppose. Uh, but then the existence of, of them. is a question. So, so there is there is some right. nitrogen on this on those carbon type asteroids that is for sure. But then there might be the drawback that we have to uh, selectively mine nitrogen rich material, and that means that we we would leave some nitrogen poor residue. So, so that means that we would leave waste material, basically, uh, and we and then the, there is a question that where to put that waste material. And and but on on Ceres we hopefully don't have that problem. So in on Ceres we can use all the material of Ceres and we get the right amount of nitrogen. And we can have this flexibility because our radiation shields and the soil they are the waste trash trash bin of the of the materials. Right. So we can put all the leftover materials there without worrying about about their exit composition yes i see right that is a that is a really nice feature i think of o'neill cylinders generally that you have this uh uh this ability to be agnostic about uh what the composition mm -hmm. of that radiation shielding is because almost all elements work as well i mean there are some small differences but mm -hmm. you really could put whatever the the leftovers are and uh, mm -hmm. it's as effective. So, um, well, I, I uh, Eric, are there yeah. some more questions? That maybe oh, we yeah. Can sorry, to? sorry. Yeah. I realized yeah. I was muted there and <laughs> started asking one. Oh. Um, uh, we had a question <laughs> from from chat about um, about kind of the different layout of, of different cylinders. Would you expect some of these cylinders to be dedicated to farming and some dedicated to cities and governments or um, kind of every one being a, a mix, you know, how, how do you think in a mega constellation like this with many, many cylinders that would kind of lay out? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, I don't have strong opinions on that yet. So, mm -hmm. uh, but what, what I would imagine at least is that uh, some of the space on the mega satellite disk would not be these living cylinders, but instead mm -hmm. would be reserved for zero, I mean, microgravity mm -hmm. manufacturing facilities simply. So, so I think we need manufacturing yeah. facilities to make more of those cylinders and that industry must be somewhere. Mm -hmm. And, and some, at least some of those processes probably might work better in, yeah. in reduced yeah. gravity or in, or in microgravity than than mm -hmm. in the cylinders themselves, and also for from the safety point of view, it's good to put it's good to put put those some at least some of the industry away from people, so so that mm -hmm. if there is some explosion or something on the on the yeah. industrial side, then the, you, you don't threaten the the, the, the habitats mm -hmm. themselves. Yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah, that, I mean, this is something Jeff and I have been doing research on recently on these sort of unique manufacturing processes that. Can be enabled by microgravity mm. that's a really interesting point that you know exact same cylinder design you just have it not rotate and you have all of a sudden a microgravity mm. you know area or you know i suppose you could theoretically 
rotate at higher speeds or or rotating but lower and and be able to do different types of research and manufacturing as different levels of gravity might allow yes and actually i i would like to mention the, the, i mean to, to raise up this point here that uh, the especially the lower lower than earth gravities are kind of pretty unexplored territory as far as manufacturing is concerned so 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 we have some experience on on zero gravity we have a lot of experience about manufacturing in one g gravity but then everything in between them it's is pretty much unknown territory and and it, it might well be that there are some some industrial processes which work best in in for example in 10 percent of earth gravity or, or something like that and, and we can really readily do that with this infrastructure by just putting the cylinder rotating slower mm -hmm. some of the cylinders rotating slower mm -hmm. yeah that makes sense i mean you can figure out whatever mix you need uh for the manufacturing uh purposes and also we might find that people uh, are able to be healthy in partial gravity and prefer it because it is a lighter mm -hmm. you know environment i mean people don't weigh as much they can Mm -hmm. uh, feel, uh, you know, they're more flexible in their bodies. They can jump higher. Uh, sports are more fun. So I could imagine that there could be mm -hmm. cylinders of different gravities that uh, people can choose to live in. And then, uh, yes, especially like for that. elderly, elderly people. I mean, those who That's have right. challenges in, in, in moving. Right. Yeah, definitely a frontier for medical research. We don't know for sure that that would work, but we, we love the idea that it might be possible. And, Hopefully by that by the time we're we're building cylinders around series, we know uh, exactly what uh, what is uh, prescribed medically for people. Um, well, this is this is such such a unique uh, uh, concept. I, I I'm really glad we were able to get you on the show and and share your vision with uh, this wider audience because I think mm -hmm. it it really adds to the discussion that uh, our community has been having over the. Well, the last few decades really about uh, what might be possible. O'Neill kind of showed the way, but there's uh, been a lot of attention in how do we get started with very small cylinders in low Earth mm -hmm. orbit. And now you're taking it to the extreme other end of uh, mm -hmm. what kind of an end point might be mm -hmm. as we uh, as we truly scale as a civilization. So yeah, anything yeah, so, else so you wanted to share that maybe we, we, we missed? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah the, 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 there is no planet b but there is certainly plan b which mm -hmm. might even become plan a at some point so <laughs> yeah i mean at the scale we're talking about you know potentially trillions of people around series you know you can mm -hmm. get yeah mm -hmm. that could easily become the plan a considering how much population we can fit you know fit on earth so sure oh, and i also like the I, I like the idea that uh it it, it isn't that if series doesn't exist we're completely out of luck like we could build these around several of the larger mm -hmm. asteroids mm -hmm. you know in the belt and uh and possibly even free floating stations like you said it doesn't have to orbit one of these larger um, mm -hmm. um bodies right they could just be in the asteroid belt and still connected so that they don't have a collision problem but then getting from one settlement to another does become of a, a transportation problem mm -hmm. you know? yeah. Well, we're kind of out of time here. Um, we have some more interesting technical questions, but I'll go ahead and put a link to the paper in the show notes uh, in, in the YouTube and, and the podcast uh, when that gets out. So uh, any of our listeners can uh, can read through the paper you know yourselves. It's uh, I find it fascinating and uh, it really does address a lot of these technical issues. So um, so we're, I guess we'll wrap up here, but you know, Pekka, thank you so much for coming on and, and yeah. kind of sharing this this great idea of uh, of this mega constellation of what some of these, you know, we've been talking about, like Jeff said, we've been talking about things like O'Neill cylinders and, and different ways to support light from space, but uh, really interesting to kind of look at a an application of that on a, on a much grander scale. So thank you so much for, mm -hmm. for joining us. Yeah, it was my pleasure. And thank you for your interest in this um, topic. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, for all our listeners, uh, you know, you can reach out to to us if you've got an idea for future discussion topics, people you'd like us to interview, um, you know, you just want to engage with the show, uh, feel free to email us. Our email is ourfutureinspace at orbitalassembly.com. 
And you can also reach out to us on Twitter at our future space or Facebook at our future in space. So thank you for, for joining us and uh, we will uh, see you guys in two weeks. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.